Hey, I have a very interesting guest with me. Somebody uh, you really want to see and listen to. Uh, Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed is joining us. I think it starts with uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, who grossly violated the basic norms of parliamentary democracy by deciding to become the governor general and not the prime minister. In a parliamentary democracy, real power is vested in the prime minister and the governor general is the titular. The constitution never was promulgated. It took nine years to agree on a constitution. It was not enforced because no elections were held. Would I be right in saying that your reading of history basically portrays Jinnah as someone who believed in a one-man show? In his mind, he thought that without him, Pakistan didn't stand a chance of stabilizing and he alone would exercise powers in a way that Pakistan would overcome the first trauma of a million people killed, 14, 15 million people forced out of their homes and made to flee across the border. I would grant this commitment to him that he thought he, he alone carried the burden of Pakistan on his shoulders. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this uh, new episode of Political Economy This Week with Asad Ijaz Bhatt on New Wave Global. Today, I have a very uh, interesting guest with me, somebody uh, you really want to see and listen to. Uh, Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed is joining us uh, to talk about uh, Pakistan's political history. And of course, we'd focus on the current uh, political impasse in Pakistan and, you know, what his research tells us on how we can navigate through the current crisis and you know what lies ahead for uh, a country like Pakistan. A lot of us think that it's a rocky road ahead, but we try to sort of uh, rationalize some of these uh, expectations for Pakistan uh, through this conversation with Dr. Ishtiaq Ahmed. We would uh, let me welcome him first. Uh, welcome, sir. Thank you for joining. Thank you, uh, Ijaz Bhatsab. It is It's a pleasure talking to you. I was looking forward to uh, today's uh, discussion with you. Thank you. Thank you very much for taking our time, sir. We, I, I remember I did an interview with you a couple of years ago, and we'd been planning uh, planning this for a very long time. So we, I think, uh, finally uh, converged to today's time. And I think it's an interesting time in Pakistan, if you see, sir. Uh, you know, there's a constitutional crisis, which is kind of uh, brimming up uh, especially in the, in the apex court and how things are shaping up. Today, National Assembly celebrated its uh, 50 years uh, golden jubilee and uh, one, of the, one of the judges of the Supreme Court also participated. Uh, do you think, sir, looking at Pakistan's history, I'll just start off with this question and then we'll keep moving forward. I'm, I'm very interested in talking about your book also that came out and created a lot of buzz. But uh, let's just focus on, the, on, on, on contemporary Pakistan. Do you think, sir, that, you know, uh, this current political impasse is sort of unique in Pakistan's history? Or do you think Pakistan's history is kind of, uh, kind of uh, uh, right with, with, with such issues? I think Pakistan's history is settled with such, uh, you know, recurring paralysis of the state. I say yes. paralysis of the state, but because the state institutions have uh, not been performing the way uh, the norms about them exist. You know, the norm in the world today is civilian supremacy and the governments in power, given a mandate by the people, then have the right to rule during the period when they have a majority in the house. That's the parliamentary system. And Pakistan has never, ever really managed it uh, according to the established standards, uh, we do say that once at least there was a transition uh, peaceful from one to another government, uh, from one party to another party government, but within the preceding party, I think two prime ministers or three were removed. So Pakistan's checkered history uh, is is something which is uh, intrinsic to the Pakistani political system because I think Pakistan came into being without any clear vision as to what they wanted after they had had India partitioned to create a homeland for Muslims who they believed 
were threatened in a united India because uh, the Hindus were a majority and would remain a permanent majority. Therefore, they needed a state of their own in where they were in a majority, that is the Muslims. And that would be the saving of both Muslims of India and of Islam. Uh, so that brought the partition of India and Pakistan came into being. But thereafter, I think it starts with uh, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the founder of Pakistan, who grossly violated the basic norms of parliamentary democracy by deciding to become the governor general and not the prime minister. Because in a parliamentary democracy, uh, real power, executive power is vested in the prime minister and the governor general is a titular or a ceremonial head of state. But Jinnah Saab decided to be governor general who was also, I call, um, one chapter in my book is the all-powerful head of state, Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So he presided over all parliamentary uh, cabinet meetings until I think about April 1948. Thereafter, he began to feel ill and, and uh, that practice probably came to an end. But while governor general, he then dismissed elected governments, especially in the Northwest frontier. And so once Jinnah Saab and his prestige and his authority were removed and Liaquat Ali Khan, the prime minister, was assassinated, uh, it was the bureaucrats who would appoint somebody as uh, prime minister, dismiss him, bring another, and that continued till 1948 when the first military coup took place. Thereafter, I would say, because the, the constitution never was promulgated, it took nine years to uh, really agree on a constitution, but it was not put into, it was not enforced because no elections were held. And then comes the military uh, takeover, followed by two other, you know, major military uh, takeovers, you know, under Ziaul Haq and General Musharraf. All that, according to political science theory, means that you undermine the prestige of institutions. So I would say this is really rooted in the very origin of Pakistan, which, I mean, it came so quickly into being that none of the things were really worked out. It's a long answer to your question, but I think it was important to put things in perspective. No, sir, it was very informative and insightful, but I'll just come back to the Jinnah point uh, that yeah. you raised, sir. Uh, when you say that he uh, dismissed a few uh, provincial governments and he was yeah. uh, chairing cabinet meetings despite being the governor general, which was a titular or a ceremonial role, do you yeah. think that there was some sort of an overreach of the office of the governor general? And do you think uh, it was, you know, it was an activism of some sort or, a, or authoritarianism of some sort that Jinnah was, you know, uh, sort of came out to be uh, that big, uh, big uh, autocrat who was chairing these? Is, is, is yes, I think he was, he was an autocrat. He's on record in, uh, you know, demeaning his own colleagues. I mean, he's, I've quoted him and this is very well known saying that uh, I have uh, spurious coins in my pocket. You know, when you say that in my jeb mein kho apna, eh, wo kya kehte hai, khote sikke hai, what do you mean? I mean <laughs> patruk, patruk, patruk sikke. Uh, and, and then he's on record saying that Pakistan was created by me and my typewriter. That's what he said. So, obviously, he didn't have much respect for the people around him who, appoint, who he appointed as prime minister and ministers and so on. And he believed that he alone could serve Pakistan's best interests. This I'm willing to grant, that he did it in the belief that without him, Pakistan wouldn't get a chance. But in doing so, he undermined the praxis of parliamentary democracy. There is a book published by Oxford University Press by Ellen McGrath. 
and it's the title is the destruction of parliamentary democracy where this point is amply made and then our first uh, political scientist uh, khalid bin said's book pakistan the formative phase makes the same point so the trouble begins with jena and his autocratic way of of exercising his powers so so would i be right in saying that your reading of history basically you know sort of portrays jena as someone who believed in a one man show and someone who was who was if i may have to say this who was really self obsessed and arrogant arrogant self obsessed i would not challenge at all but i would still say that in his mind he thought that without him pakistan didn't stand a chance of stabilizing and he alone would exercise powers in a way that pakistan would overcome the first trauma of a million people killed 14 15 million people forced out of their uh, you know homes and made to flee across the border so i would grant this commitment to him that he thought he, he alone carried the burden of pakistan on his shoulders but you know great leaders for good and bad do start feeling that way so jena sahab is not the only one only i don't think by temperament he was a democratic person at all uh, all along in his political career he was taking part in constitutional debates and so on but when his leadership question came he would never brook any challenge to his leadership whether it was mahatma gandhi which forced him to leave the congress or later among uh, among the leaders who were uh, at that time competing for the leadership of the muslims of india and mm -hmm. he emerged as the most powerful so he was a competent politician as a politician i think he out witted out maneuvered Gandhi, Nehru, Azad, Patel, and got Pakistan and convinced the British that creating Pakistan would be in their best interest. So that's a amazing achievement as a politician. People who read my book don't see the way I, in a very uh, sophisticated manner, do acknowledge his leadership qualities while simultaneously pointing out. some of the consequences of such a leadership i think people look at things black and white sir if you say one thing against jinnah that means the entire book is against jinnah so yes <laughs> that's the pro problem with problem with cult leaders and, and yes that's it right. cult leaders <laughs> very well put very well put and, and 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 talking about cult leadership and 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 you said that most great leaders are like that uh we also saw that when bhutto wrote if i am assassinated uh just a few months before his ultimate assassination he also said he kind of alluded to the fact that he did rig the 1977 elections but he said that i did so because i knew that there is no better leadership available in pakistan and if I, if someone has to save pakistan that can only be me do you think sir that and then of course we see another cult leader now Becoming big in Pakistan, who thinks that I am the only savior? Uh, do you think that at Jinnah's time, because it was a new state that Jinnah had so painstakingly formed, do you think that he was, you know, this was not out of arrogance, but you know, a sheer sense of over protection for the country that he was forming, and he could, he he thought that he had to, you know, take the country in it in in his own arms and do everything himself as as the father of the nation. Do you think that would also be one of the reasons? Well, I'm sure if you were to go into his mind, he, this would be exactly his way of thinking. Yes, I'm not questioning that. I'm saying that he could have done the same by becoming the prime minister of Pakistan, because then it would be within the parameters of the parliamentary democracy system. It's not the governor general who does these things. On the other on on the other side, we had Jawaharlal Nehru. although uh, in the case of nehru they already had many other leaders of great magnitude uh, and they had a constitution already worked out 
in which the principles were laid down in 1928, 1931, 1932. Three major resolutions of the Congress party later on became the basis of the Indian constitution. But in the case of Pakistan, Jinnah Saab famously kept on giving contradictory uh, pledges to different sections of the of, of the Muslim community. Like the peers and the mullahs were told that, of course, in a state of Muslim, the Sharia law and Islam would be supreme. Then when talking to people like you and me, he would say, you know, uh, democracy is in the blood of Muslims. Now, what does that mean? Ultimately, the Constituent Assembly had people remembering his different contradictory speeches. And that came to haunt Pakistan. Even now, I can quote three main positions of Jinnah. And you can choose the one you like. So that's it. But that's not the case with the way the Congress Party and the way their constitution was already worked out and Nehru and, uh, you know, exercise power, but within the bounds of the constitution. Jinnah Saab, by temperament, followed by, uh, uh, I'm, I'm so happy you mentioned uh, Zulfkar Ali Bhutto. In this book, I was about to say, if I am assassinated, this is exactly what he's saying, that without me, Pakistan is not going to survive. And then now we have Imran Khan, who I think is a reincarnation of these two. Uh, <laughs> and, and so uh, whether all leaders have this tendency or not, there are leaders who are democratic, who are bound by uh, laws and, and external principles. And there are leaders who believe they are men of destiny. And Jinnah Saab and Bhutto Saab and Imran Khan Saab are people who believe that they are men of destiny. Without them, their country, their party has no future. So that's the profile, uh, leadership profile of these three. Sir, uh, since you put these three into the same bracket, would that be fair to say that Jinnah was also a populist in his own times? Oh, he, much more than populist. He used the Hindu-Muslim division uh, differences to make an ideology out of it. The two-nation theory simply says Hindus and Muslims cannot live together in one state as peacefully. And then when on the 31st of March 1941 at Kanpur, the Muslims of that uh, Hindu majority province confronted him, sir, what will happen to us? The Lahore resolution demands Pakistan in areas where virtually there is a Pakistan. All the chief ministers in northwestern India and in eastern India are Muslims. What will happen to us? And Jinnah angrily, and I've quoted him verbatim, says that I will have two clone Muslims go through martyrdom and get smashed in order to liberate seven crore from, uh, uh, you know, the rule of uh, the Hindus or the Congress party, things like this. So you can check it in my book. Uh, so if now Pakistan was meant to be the state to save Islam and Muslims, uh, Ijaz Bhatt Saab, you tell me, which type of Muslims would be the most vulnerable to alleged Hindu domination? Those who are left in the minority provinces. But he had no better argument than to uh, say this to them. So I think uh, Jinnah was a, a populist par excellence. I would go <laughs> so far uh, in calling him a populist leader. Because, of course, religion-wise, and there are many differences between Hindus and Muslims. But then, for seven centuries, when Muslims were ruling, they didn't create a separate Pakistan for Muslims, did they? It's only when, uh, I think, the British take over, and there is a possibility that after the British, there will be some sort of democracy, that the Muslim upper classes started fearing democracy in which their land ownership and their 
prominent sort of positions might be threatened because Nehru in 1936 said that in a free future India, we will abolish the Zimidari system, which is actually the Jagirdari system. And we will reform India in the light of the Soviet socialist ex ex experiment of building a fairer socialist society. After that, I think Jinnah Saab got a breakthrough in the Muslim majority provinces, telling them, look, either you jump onto the Muslim League bandwagon or your big landlord, you know, position. And so they would be threatened in a united India. And that worked very well. So as a politician, I think he was very sharp in, in understanding what sort of contradictions were emerging and how to use them to his advantage. Without him, possibly, Pakistan may not have come into being. Although I am reluctant to say it so strongly about one individual, but definitely he was very central to what brought about the partition of India. So do you think that the circumstances that existed pre-partition, that, mm -hmm. you know, if Jinnah had to, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, remove, you know, uh, seven crore Muslims, as you as you quoted from the clutches of colonization, he needed mm -hmm. to have a very strong cult uh, following to do it. And of course, he, he there was no other way than you know these populist sloganeering to you know bring people to a pass where they could you know come up with a massive uprising against the against the yes. against the Congress Party and the British. Yeah, and the success story is the 1945-46 elections, which the Muslim League won by a landslide. You know, out of 495 reserved seats for Muslims, they won 440 seats. Yeah. So no denying that Jinnah's call that Islam and Muslims will be danger in a united India did work wonders for him. So his populism is the basis for Pakistan coming into being. But then remember, once you use populism, the genie is out of the, out of the bottle and you can't put it back again. And so that genie keeps coming back in one form or another. That's what I'm saying. Sir, uh, just another question about, uh, you know, Jinnah's upbringing as a politician since we you know we're zooming into his personality and how yeah. and and his later uh, years as a as a politician do you think that he was raised in a very undemocratic tradition in uh, the pre-partition india which is and and you could see uh, impressions of that when he ultimately became the governor general and 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 just like you mentioned that you know his the overreach of the governor general's office was very evident at the time. Do you think that his lack of belief or his disbelief in constitutional parliamentary democracy was a result of him being raised in a very undemocratic transition uh, tradition? Well, you know, many people in Pakistan would argue that Jinnah, by temperament, was a constitutionalist. Yeah. And if you look at his record, uh, once he entered politics. He was very famous for making great speeches on in the uh, Central Assembly, you know, and and uh, some of the speeches are fascinating. Absolutely. So I would not deny Jena Saab the capability to make very impressive speeches and which are uh, the in the earlier period very much those of reminding the British that they are ruling India in an undemocratic manner. So yes. that's one phase yes. in Jena. But you see, India had been united. There was one administration and people had moved from one place to another. Things had changed a lot in the last hundred or so years before the Pakistan question came into being. And now if you wanted to divide India, you had to find all those arguments which said no chance Hindus and Muslims can live together in peace in a united India. So that means you have to overplay the populist card. But the consequences of playing such a card is that once the state came into being, uh, it was overburdened, saddled by all these contradictory views. And Jinnah Saab dies on the 11th of 
uh, September 1948, there was a fair chance then to sort out his message, but it was not possible. I've quoted uh, uh, Dr. Yakub Bangesh, one of our eminent historians. Uh, he says that he talked to Pakistan's former foreign minister, Saib Zayda Yaqub Ali Khan, to tell him how, what does he remember of his time as the military aide to Governor General uh, Muhammad Ali Jena. And Saib Zayda Yaqub Ali Khan said that uh, he and uh, Sayyid Ahsan, who was the naval head, uh, aide, we both as young people went to uh, Jena Saab one day. It was about 8.30. He was about to retire. And we said, sir, from India, we hear every day news that in the making of their constitution, they are proceeding very fast. And this is going to be part of the constitution. And so a new thing happens. Every day it is in the news. Why nothing is happening in Pakistan? And Jena told him very honestly, look, boys, I have been saying different things to different uh, Muslims. So it will take time before this is sorted out. And I leave it to the Pakistan Constituent Assembly to frame a constitution for Pakistan. So he is himself admitted that because of these uh, populist slogans and promises he had made right, left and center, once they were going to haunt Pakistan and they haunt Pakistan even today. So that's what I'm saying. That's not the case with the way the Indian National Congress uh, led the freedom movement and initially uh, the constitution, the government elections were uh, institutionalized and that continues. Although now we find in India, the Hindu Nationalist Party, the BJP, trying to modify that constitution to make India some sort of a Hindu Rashtra. Uh, so that's for them to decide. But uh, in Pakistan, this problem was there from day one. Sir, uh, my next question was about India. So thanks for taking me in that direction. Uh, yeah. Thank you for a very elaborate answer, sir. Uh, of course, we've in the in the in the in the recent past, we've seen how India's uh, democratic institutions are tearing up with the with the rise of uh, violence and RSS and Bharatiya Janata Party and, you know, uh, right-wing uh, violent populism also uh, yeah. uh, taking root in India. Uh, and I've been talking to people about this, you know, 75 years into the formation of both the countries. India had a very secular-looking, strengthened uh, democracy, but the same, of course, could not uh, take place in Pakistan. Do you, uh, do you think... Uh, and now, of course, Pakistan has entered into a new phase of political instability. Do you think that, you know, how democracy shaped up India and how it shaped up Pakistan, do you think, you know, the relative shaping up of democracies in the two countries has, has ideological roots? And somebody sitting in 1947 could predict how India will shape up in the next 50 or 100 years and how Pakistan will shape up in the next 50 or 100 years? I think there was absolute, absolutely a gap between the educated elite uh, or let's say the leadership of the Indian National Congress and even of the Muslim League. Almost all of them had gone to universities and had law degrees or uh, whatever and had been groomed in, in sort of parliamentary ways of doing politics, including agitation, the way Mahatma Gandhi kept violence out, but mass action was done to violate the law without, you know, generating violence. So that's a very unique way of doing politics. Uh, but did this percolate deep down among the people? Did they want democracy? Did they want uh, all the freedoms of or democratic freedoms, one can only wonder because society in our part of the world was still very traditional, very much bound by uh, medieval and even ancient ideas of what is right and wrong. Whereas in the West, uh, society and state have in interaction developed together into yes. what, 
what we now say are modern uh, democracies. Uh, but the Western our, democracy, basically. Yeah, but in our case, it was the leadership which embraced democratic ideals, definitely in India. And in a way, even Pakistani politicians were, uh, you know, committed to a constitution and to making Pakistan some sort of a parliamentary democracy. In the case of Pakistan, the problem was that such a democracy had to be in consonance with Quran and Sunnah. And that opens the Pandora box. Who is going to tell us what is appropriate democracy consistent with the Quran and Sunnah? And there, I think, uh, inadvertently or by the logic of creating a state for Muslims in the name of religion, the upper hand was given to uh, uh, people who were scholars of Islam, like Madhudi. He opposed the creation of Pakistan. It's so ironic. He said, Ke Pakistan jo hai, ye na Pakistan hai. This is, these are his words. But as soon as Pakistan came into being, and let me underline, Jinnah Saab invited uh, uh, Madhudi to start making lectures on Radio Pakistan about Islam. So, Bringing him back into politics, a man who opposed Pakistan begins with Jinnah's way of defining the Pakistan identity. I'll give you some more examples. For example, he wrote to the head of the uh, Muslim Brotherhood, Khwan al Muslimin, uh, Hassan al Banna, that, sir, please send us a Muslim scholar who could guide us how to make Pakistan an ideal Islamic state. Then he established a department in Punjab called the, the Institute of Islamic Reconstruction, in which Bolana uh, Alama Muhammad Asad was made the head, and Asad was a follower of Iqbal. So they, such an uh, institute was to uh, advise the government how to make Pakistan an Islamic state have an Islamic economy, have an is Islamic educational system, uh, and so on. So this was the uh, uh, brief given to this uh, institute. Then uh, another example would be that uh, I think on the 21st of January or February 1948, while speaking to the Karachi Bar Association, once again, angrily, he said, I don't know why people keep asking me what will be the constitution of Pakistan. The constitution of Pakistan was given 1300 years ago. It will be democratic and Islamic and so on. Now, democratic, Islamic, are they, uh, can one combine them and, and establish a stable order? The experience shows that it's not been a success. Why did we need to have four constitutions? And after the constitutions, one after the other were superseded, more and more of Islam, fundamentalist type of Islam has been included, especially during the time of uh, Ziaul Haq. It was later validated by the Pakistan National Assembly. So that's the problem. You know, the uh, blasphemy law and all have been uh, validated by the Pakistan National Assembly. So now, what do you do with this? Once you bring Islam into the Pakistani or in politics, there is no way you can withdraw it without risking your neck. It happened only recently when one of the ministers of uh, Nawaz Sharif, he wanted to change one word in the oath that the Prime Minister and the uh, President of Pakistan take, and he had to run for his life. So all this is happening in a state founded uh, for Muslims to save Islam. And how do you do it? By bringing Islam into your polity and then trying to make a constitution out of it. That has not been very successful. It's neither fish nor fowl. You know, both sorts of things are there in the constitution. Article 19 says, gives you all the fundamental rights you would expect in a modern liberal democracy. But then it also says that everything has to be done for the glory of Islam. That's also in the constitution. Now, I think that's a rider which 
depends on who is interpreting and they, that, that's the problem. Sir, uh, thank you for a very detailed answer. We're just uh, rushing out of time now, last three minutes. And yeah. uh, uh, we usually record for 30 minutes. Uh, sir, my last question to you would be, uh, that, you know, looking at the current political impasse in Pakistan, and I'll come back to the question from where we started the show. Yeah. Uh, last time when I interviewed you, you said, volatility is built into Pakistan. And I've been quoting this statement to people. I, I really... What did I say? Say it again. You said volatility is built into volatility, Pakistan. Volatility, yes, volatility, yes. Volatility is yes. built into Pakistan, yes. So do you think that this volatility is going to continue and we would see, you know, uh, more rounds of political instability? Or do you think Pakistan is now headed in the right direction given that it's the third democratic transition which is taking place and governments, despite, you know, a lot of political upheavals, governments are now completing their five-year terms. Do you see that as a welcome development? And do you see, you know, the dust settling down now on uh, political instability in Pakistan? I would say that the volatility we talked about two years ago has turned into an explosive situation. Yeah. So what I then used to describe uh, Pakistan is now in its most uh, explosive stage. And I only hope our political leaders would have the wisdom, the foresight to save Pakistan from this explosion. I want Pakistan to stabilize as a democracy. And that means somebody has to make an effort to weed out those laws, medieval laws, which stand in the way of uh, even Muslims but more so the minorities in being equal citizens of a state, you know, the way the minorities have been brutally mistreated uh, uh, is all too obvious. You just have to read the reports of the Human Rights Commission of Pakistan. So this is the last, I think, uh, uh, chance for Pakistan. And I wish the Pakistan government and the leaders uh, all the best if they really want to make Pakistan a democracy, then all extremism has to be weeded out. You have to have good relations with your neighbors, of course, based on respect for the independence and sovereignty of Pakistan. And if there are any issues, you settle them down through mutual accommodation. And internally, Hindu, Sikh, Christian, Qadiani, whosoever is not into fit into our bill of being a Muslim should not be targeted, I think, as is done. Yeah. We'd have to stop at this point. Thank you for joining us. It was a pleasure having you. And I'm sure my audience learned a lot from you, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank